flexibility. This leads to the most surreal episode of the story, again, according to Carlos Allende. In a waterfront tavern, a group of sailors from the Eldridge are drinking. One thing leads to another, and a fight breaks up. It is a garden variety bar brawl, with one difference. The sailors are fading in and out of sight. The sailors involved in the fracas became invisible, dissipated the thin air in front of frightened patrons and, and waitresses, and just they, just, they were there one minute and gone the next. Faced with these bizarre after effects and the carnage aboard the Eldridge, the Navy, it is said, deep sixes the whole operation. The scientific team is dissolved, further experiments canceled. The Eldridge's logs are said to be altered to show that she was never in Philadelphia Naval Yard. Witnesses are forced to sign draconian oaths of secrecy. And so closes the Navy's World War II experiment in invisibility and teleportation. Project Rainbow, as it is called, is canceled. Classified, as some say, beyond top secret. But as legend has it, the Navy hasn't sunk the experiment quite deeply enough. A shadowy figure would slip through all their elaborate security precautions to tell the tale of the Philadelphia experiment. As we continue, the Navy's alleged secret is exposed in a legendary book. Just one revelation among many. These three writers solved all the mysteries of the universe. They talked about modes and methods of travel used by UFOs. They talked about the behavior and ethos of the beings that, that, that man these outer spacecraft. Elsewhere in the world in 1943, in Virginia, the Pentagon, then the world's largest office building, was completed after only 16 months of construction. In Germany, where there was a wartime shortage of morphine, scientists developed methadone as a synthetic painkiller. And across the U.S., federal income taxes were withheld from the paychecks of American workers for the first time. To search any time in history, please visit the World Timeline at HistoryChannel.com. How the story of the Philadelphia experiment originates is a legend in its own right, involving UFOs, visionary naval officers, and the curious life and mysterious death of Morris K. Jessup. Jessup is a scientist and author, one of the early investigators into the paranormal. He was always curious about unexplained things. And he always thought that science should take a look at the exceptions and the uh, erratics, I think he used to call them, the, the, the things that didn't fit the theories. In 1955, he publishes The Case for the UFO, the book is a brave attempt to legitimize a subject that has already been corrupted by pulp magazines and B-movies. Now you have to understand that the time period Jessup decided to become interested in UFOs was possibly the worst possible time to become involved in UFOs for any reason. The government cracked down tremendously on any, quote, believers. This official scorn disguises a real government interest. Reports are coming in from military pilots of flying objects no one can explain. I had a man working for me, uh, a lieutenant by the name of Bill Ditch was one of our real bright ones. He was by himself, and he said he looked off to the side, and he said there was something flying formation on him. 
and he, it was there for about five or ten minutes, and then he said it peeled off. He said it was sort of saucer-shaped, and it was glowing slightly. UFO reports from Navy pilots are forwarded to Project Blue Book, the official Air Force investigation. But the Navy seldom, if ever, hears a word in return. We were never able to find out anything from them at all. It was a, a one-way street. It was a sink, as far as we were concerned. Stonewalled by the Air Force, some Navy officers begin their own unofficial UFO investigation. Among them, Lieutenant Commander George Hoover and Captain Sidney Sherby of the Office of Naval Research. One day in 1955, a mysterious item arrives at ONR headquarters that piques the officer's interest. It comes in a plain manila envelope with a cryptic greeting. There was no return address on it. The uh, post office stamp was Seminole, Texas. And um, on the back side of it, the handwriting was scrawled, Happy Easter. Inside the envelope, a paperback copy of Morris K. Jessup's The Case for the UFO. Its margins are filled with comments in three different colors of ink, and apparently three different kinds of handwriting. The way these people talked, and the, if you read the comments that uh, were scribbled into the book, they were talking about being someplace off the surface of the earth. Uh, aliens, if you want to call them that. These three writers solved all the mysteries of the universe. I mean, they talked about modes and methods of travel used by UFOs. They talked about the behavior and ethos of the beings that, that, that man these outer spacecraft. The writers also claim knowledge of a top secret project during World War II to make a warship disappear. U.S. Navy's Force Field Experiments, 1943, October, the book reads, produced invisibility of ship and crew, fearsome results so terrifying. Fortunately, halt further research. It is the first mention of what's come to be known as the Philadelphia Experiment, the birth of a legend. The Navy officers are intrigued by the book. They summon Morris Jessup to ONR headquarters to see if the author can shed any light on its origins. Jessup recognizes some of the handwriting in the book. Strangely, he has also received letters in that same unmistakable hand, signed by a man who identifies himself as a former merchant marine, Carlos Allende. The writing style of Carlos Allende fairly screamed crackpot. And yet, maybe the man was simply exaggerating something he had seen or heard about. Ever since, people have been mystified by the apparent top-level military interest in a book about UFOs. Morris K. Jessup, for one, is left shaking his head over the Navy's interest. He is said to begin his own investigation into the Philadelphia experiment. By 1959, he has reportedly made a breakthrough and is about to share his discovery with a colleague named Dr. Manson Valentine. In April 1959, Morris Jessup called up his friend, Dr. Valentine, and said, I, I think I found something in regards to the Philadelphia experiment that I've been researching, and I really want to show you what I, what I found. Um, they made an appointment to have dinner and go over the uh, go over his research the following day. On the next day, however, April 20th, 1959, Jessup's car is discovered in a park in Coral Gable, Florida. Its engine is still running. A hose stretches from the exhaust pipe to inside the car. Inside is Morris K. Jessup, still breathing, though he soon expires from carbon monoxide poisoning. An apparent suicide, or is it? It's absolutely interesting that instead of arriving at uh, Dr. Valentine's house, he instead chose to uh, go to a park and allegedly commit suicide.